True Crime South Africa is published in conjunction with Arena Holdings, publishers of Times Live, Business Live, Sowetan Live and others. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent the views of Arena Holdings and its affiliates. Welcome to True Crime South Africa. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht and you're listening to an interview with Zibeth Hansen, clinical psychologist in the Department of Correctional Services. Before we get into today's episode, I'd like to thank our new Patreon supporters. A huge thank you goes out to Michelle, Sweet Georgia Frown, Danielle Lainsley, Olivia S., Ashley Bernarde, Troy Mokowem, Olivia, Lucia Siofi, and Kalinka Full. And also to Ilka Zenskirali for her donation through PayPal. Thank you so much, everyone. I really do appreciate your support. If you'd like to support the show through Patreon or PayPal, I'll leave the links in the show notes. We also have new ways to support the show. You can head over to Audible and purchase the audiobook The Krugersdorp Cult Killings by Jana Marx, which I narrated. Or you can also shop for your health and beauty needs on the online store King Online and use the discount code TCSA10 at checkout to get a 10% discount and support the show. As always, any form of support is greatly appreciated, and it doesn't have to be financial. Sharing of episodes, inviting your friends and family to listen, and interacting on social media all go a long way to help keeping the show growing and improving. The interview that you'll be hearing today has been a long time coming. Zibeth Hansen and I connected just over a year ago, and she's given me quite a few good pointers about parole and the justice system along the way. When we discussed the possibility of her being interviewed on the podcast, she did, of course, have to get permission from the Department of Correctional Services. And then COVID hit. And, of course her work environment became significantly more difficult. I am over the moon that I eventually got the opportunity to talk to Zibeth, though, and share that conversation with you, because I think that the insights she has to provide are invaluable. When I cover cases on the podcast, we very often end off, at least in the solved cases, with the offender going off to jail. Occasionally, I'll discuss parole opportunities that the offenders in question had. But in general, we don't ever really get a view of what happens once the prison door clangs shut behind the offender. And I think that's why today's interview is super important, because it gives us a whole new view, not just to violent crimes, but also to the people that commit them. And in Zibeth's case, the people that are tasked with helping to rehabilitate these offenders. Zibeth Hansen is a clinical psychologist. She works at Brantflay Correctional Facility. If you have an image of what a psychologist working in a prison looks like and sounds like, Zibeth is the complete opposite. She is sweet, kind and fun to be around. To be honest, she wouldn't be out of place as a nursery school teacher, and I could picture her getting down and dirty with a pack of toddlers. That was not Zibeth's calling, though. She chose to work with human beings that are perhaps on the complete opposite end of that spectrum. And after speaking to her, I think she chose well. I spoke to Zibeth for just over three hours, I could have sat and chatted to her for twice that. Zibeth is not just going to share her experiences as a psychologist, but also invaluable, realistic information about how the justice system works. So let's get into my interview with Zibeth Hansen, clinical psychologist at the Department of Correctional Services. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, 
please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counseling or services, please see the helpline information on our show notes. Here's Zibeth to introduce herself. Zibeth Hansen, clinical psychologist working at the Department of Correctional Services at Brandfly Management Area. I asked Zibeth how she came to be working in a correctional services setting. I've actually just been working in correctional services since I started. So I really knew from the start that I wanted to go into criminal psychology or forensic psychology as we know it. I started right after my studies. I did my internship at a government facility and then did my community service at Grootvlei Prison just outside of Bloemfontein. From there moved to the private prison for two years and then came back to the bottom of correctional services in 2017 and I've been at Brandfly ever since. So at this point I said, hang on, we have private prisons. I think it was the first time I'd heard that term used. And of course, the first thing that popped into my head was the difference between private and government hospitals. So I had to ask Zibeth to please explain. Yeah, so we do have private prisons. We have two private prisons in South Africa. So people are normally quite confused about that. Yeah. It doesn't work like private hospitals where you go to if you are now very famous yeah. or anything. Yeah. Uh, basically, what, what happened is that Post-1994, we started with, or actually in the early 90s, we started with prison reform. And that opened the door for us to, because the focus was more on rehabilitation, Mm. it opened the door a little bit for private companies to buy into corrections in South Africa. So the law was written in such a way that we could establish these prisons. So currently there's two prisons. The one is... A Mango Hoon Correctional Facility, also just outside of Bloom, mm. and it's run by G4S, the security company that everyone knows. And then the other one is just outside of Louis Trichard, um, and it's called Kutama Sintamuli. So both of them house around 3,000 maximum male offenders. And the idea was that uh, the private companies went into a lease purchase agreement with the state. So that means for 25 years, the private companies came, they built the prison facility. For 25 years, they are in operation of that facility. Government pays them per inmate that's housed there. And after 25 years, that facility becomes a state-owned facility. So it was a way for us to build a prison. Uh, We borrowed from overseas companies because they were so far ahead in in terms yeah. of what rehabilitation is and how to set up prisons, mm. because the existing prisons we had at that point was built as detention facilities. So they weren't, mm. weren't built for the rehabilitation. rehabilitation role that DCS now had to fulfill. Okay. So these two companies came in and we use those blueprints now for newly built facilities, how the prison should look, programs that should be run. And in 2025, most likely those two prisons would become state-owned facilities and would belong to DCS. So the two private prisons currently, DCS is the people who decide who goes there. A lot of the time it is our more difficult guys who need a little bit more of a firmer hand. So you know, high-ranking gangs, a couple of media cases, but you know, ultimately DCS has the power over who goes to which centre, whether that is now which government-owned centre or then either of the private prison centres. So the offender can't choose and the private prisons can't choose who they take or not. Um, DCS spreads them out for whatever reason they see fit. So I found this a really interesting concept, especially considering how limited our resources are in this country and also how overcrowded our prisons are. Having worked in both a state facility, Brantfle, and a private facility, Mangaun, I asked Zibeth if she had found any significant differences between the two. Privatisation of prisons is not such a strange concept. We actually see that quite often in the USA and Europe. So they have um, a lot of 
state-owned facilities, but also a lot of privately run facilities. So it wasn't such a strange concept to apply that in South Africa. So how it works that the two private prisons can't just do what they want. They have a very strict contract with the state governing body, so DCS. And in that contract, it stipulates exactly what should happen in those prisons. And that contract is based on the policies of DCS. So in essence, they should be run according to the same policy and procedures that DCS has. Considering the fact that private practice would likely be much more lucrative from a financial perspective, I always find it interesting when I speak to these professionals, as was the case with Dr. Sean Bauman, that chose to work in public service in difficult circumstances, and I'm sure at a lower rate of remuneration. That speaks to a great passion for their work, I think and a real desire to want to make a difference. I asked Zibeth if she had ever considered the less intense environment of the private sector. I've always known that I wanted to work within the forensic field. I never really saw myself as a therapist. I thought I would be doing a lot more court work and assessments and report writing. But I've come to really enjoy my work at DCS. So now, currently, my main job is within the the correctional environment, Mm. which I really enjoy. And I, people always ask me if I'm going to stay there forever. (laughs) I don't know, but I don't have plans um, of particularly looking for something else. I do have a small private practice on the side, uh, which is also not your mainstream private practice. So I do some psycholegal court work. And I work with addiction, addiction and trauma. Yeah, so on the side, in my private practice, um, it's not a, a strict therapeutic practice as you would yes. know in normal private practice. It's interesting that Zibeth chooses to work with cases of addiction or substance abuse in her private work. Because, as I then discussed with her, many of the offenders she would be seeing would likely have addiction and substance abuse issues in their lives leading up to their crimes. So it fits in quite nicely with her work at DCS. In my prep work for the interview, I'd also noted that Zibeth is working toward a new qualification focused on addiction therapy. Yes, I'm doing a postgraduate diploma in addiction care through Stellenbosch at the moment. I'll be done by the end of the year. So, and the reason I I went into that degree or started looking into that postgraduate diploma is because I found that substances contribute so vastly to, as a criminogenic need for these guys, to why they are there. If you ask them, especially the violent crimes, if you ask them, There's substances in the mix there somewhere. So not only does it contribute to them committing the offences, but it is also one of our biggest uh, factors contributing to relapse and reoffending after release. And unfortunately also, we do sometimes get substances in the prison. So it's not readily available, but it does come into the prison from time to time. So there's also some ongoing abuse which we obviously try to to curb as much as possible so the reason I went into the addiction care was to see if I can't make a difference in terms of the addiction behavior um, since that is such a big problem Mm. in the initial commission but also then in the reoffending afterwards. I asked Zibeth to tell us what her job entails on a daily basis. So no day is exactly the same so I can, I can describe the basic roles that we play within DCS. We have, on the one hand, just the mental health care of the offenders, which is pretty much the same as what you would see most psychologists in private practice do. So treating adjustment, mood disorders, anxiety, depression. Sometimes we deal with some psychosis. Um, so yeah, just your normal the normal things that we would deal outside with. We see quite a lot of trauma, so either historical trauma, childhood trauma, but sometimes also trauma related to the lifestyle they chose and also the crimes they've committed. But that basically all relates to mental health. 
Then in addition to that, we have a mandate to offer rehabilitative services. So how that differs from normal mental health care is that you need to identify the factors that contributed to the initial offending pattern. So the cycle of violence or what is the cognitions that support the behavior, um, thing, everything that intervened or contributed to them actually committing the offense. And then you start intervening on those specific identified risk factors. So that's the rehabilitative work. And then we also play a role in some of the uh, parole decisions. So we write parole reports, especially for our violent offenders, offenders who serve longer sentences, and then every offender who has a life sentence gets a report done before they are even looked at in terms of place, being placed on parole. So yeah, we write the parole reports. We also sometimes play a role in the VODs and the VOMs, and that is what we call victim offender dialogues and victim offender mediation. And those two things, maybe you can elaborate a little bit on that later. It's mostly run by spiritual care and social work, but we do also sometimes facilitate a role in that in terms of preparing the offender and then also being present when the VOD or the VOM is conducted. With so many inmates in South African prisons and a relatively low number of clinical psychologists in these facilities, I wondered how it was determined which prisoners see Zibeth and do they get to request her services themselves or does it work on some other allocation system? This is what Zibeth had to say. Yeah, I think the ideal would be that we would have contact with every offender. Unfortunately, resources are quite limited. So just in terms of resource, human resources, we are about 80 psychologists in DCS countrywide, and we have about 160,000 inmates, plus or minus a couple of thousand. So that translates into 2,000 offenders for every psychologist. Um, and that is just our incarcerated population. So that does not include probationers, parolees, those on correctional supervision. Those are physically those with prison sentences, incarcerated sentences. So it, it becomes a little bit difficult to see all of them. We try and get in contact with most of them at some point, but how it currently works, it's needs-based. There's a few avenues through which they can actually see the psychologist. One of those is that they can ask to be seen, so they can request to be seen. They can be referred by anyone else in contact with them, so that can be the nurse or the social worker or their case officer or the head of centre, parole board. So anyone can basically refer them if they pick up that there might be something that needs attention. They can also be referred, so we have a psychiatrist coming in once a month, so if he feels like the offender can benefit from therapy, they can refer them to us. And then we also have a couple of offenders who has been referred by the court. So when the sentence is handed down, as part of that, the court mandates mm. therapy um, for those offenders. And then you also need to write a report giving feedback to the court with regards to, to the intervention that was nice. done for that offender before they are paroled. I can imagine that not every offender is interested in therapy. So I asked Elizabeth whether there are offenders that push back at her efforts to help them. Yeah, we, we do have offenders who can become quite difficult. But I think ultimately, like it remains for them voluntary. So even when they sign the consent form, um, it remains voluntary for treatment services. Yeah. So if they refuse, it's not in their best interest, but they are allowed to say that they don't want to see the psychologist. But I do think most of them don't mind engaging, especially if they think that it can benefit them at some point in the future. But I also think it's the approach you take with them. So some of the guys initially they are a bit skeptic to speak to you because you work for, for the department. 
and they are very scared to disclose some things. So what happens in therapy is still confidential. How I go about in seeing them, I try to see all the offenders who get admitted to my center um, within the first three, three to six months. So what I do is I normally just have a, what I call adjustment group. So I get the names of all the new admissions. And as soon as I have enough guys to make up a group, I'll have a, a, a adjustment group with them. And in there, I just kind of get to know who they are, get to get a, a little bit of a feel for them. They also get to know who I am. So I'm not just a psychologist who sits somewhere in an office, but they kind of can put a face to, to the name. And then from there, I explain to them what it is that I do, how I can assist, what my role is, what the different role is of, of a psychologist. And then also the route of referral. So if they would want to see me, how to go about that. So in that way, I at least have some contact with everyone in my center and they know who I am to request and in future. So it, it helps for them a little bit if there's some familiarity. So at least they, they know who I am and they, they kind of know why I'm there. Yes. And I give them the opportunity also to ask questions about, you know, do they need to see the psychologist yeah. and, and all those. In preparing for the interview, Zibeth sent me a chapter of a book that she and a colleague had written about their work in DCS, with specific focus on the type of therapeutic treatment system she uses with offenders. It's called Solution-Focused Brief Therapy. And what really struck me about the approach is that it doesn't necessarily focus on the offender's crimes. It focuses on who they are as human beings. I asked Zibeth to give us a brief understanding of the approach she uses. In psychology in general, we have quite a few therapeutic intervention types. So most, the one most people probably know is CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. But we have psychoanalysis, psychodynamic work, DBT. So there's quite a wide variety of of intervention strategies. Solution-focused therapy or solution-focused brief therapy, as it's known, Mm -hmm. is an intervention strategy. It comes from a positive psychology grounding. Mm -hmm. So rather than focusing on everything that went right, it's strength-focused or strength-based. So it works really good in terms of trying to focus on, on the strength of somebody and getting those strengths developed in such a way that it compensates for some of the weaknesses. Um, or some of the struggles that a person might be experiencing. So within in corrections, I found that it worked quite well. I think first of all, because it fits my view of the world that you know people aren't just bad, there's a lot more to them. And also the fact that we tend to focus a lot on what they did wrong and the crimes they've committed and everything that went bad in their lives. And I think once you start looking at the strengths someone has, even the most terrible crime, those offenders do have strengths. Mm. So if you can find those strengths and work with them to overcome the deficits they have or to use them to counter those deficits, Mm. we can improve where we are going with them. Um, So yeah, it's just focusing on the strengths rather than the crime itself. That doesn't mean that we ignore the crime. So we still speak about the crime. We still identify the criminogenic needs. But instead of focusing on and getting stuck in the past, we're actually saying, okay, how do we move forward? And how do we make sure, or what do you have in your resource case that we can ensure that this doesn't happen again? And how can we change, use that to change your behavior? Rather than just saying, well, you were wrong. Most of them, they realize they were wrong. Yeah, exactly, Um, yeah. So rather giving them the tools to say, okay, what can you do different um, instead of doing those, those type of, of crimes and the way you think, how can you think differently? Yeah. And ultimately, this is the goal. Our correction system is rehabilitation focused. We do not have the resources to keep most offenders incarcerated indefinitely and eventually they are going to be released. So the work that Zibeth and her colleagues do in trying to prepare these offenders for re-entry into society is absolutely vital. I also really like the idea of the solutions-focused approach. 
despite some of the absolutely horrendous crimes that some offenders may have committed, they are still human beings. And I think having someone to help them focus on what they may have in terms of strengths to overcome the challenges that may have led to their crimes must be pretty refreshing to them. I asked Zibeth to give us an idea of some of the ways that she intervenes throughout an offender's journey through the correctional system. Yeah, I think every psychologist has their own way of planning the interventions and how they choose to go about the interventions. Yeah, we don't, like I said, we don't see all of the offenders in, in our care. It's just time-wise, it's not, it's not possible. So what I normally do is I, I have a little brief screening tool that I've distributed to people in the center. So if they kind of see that this is someone who, who would need therapy, mm-hmm. then they can just fill that in and send that back to me. Um, and that way it's kind of a brief assessment. Mm-hmm. So not necessarily by someone who's trained, but just someone who can pick up some of the crimes or if there's certain crime patterns, they can be sent to me. When I see them, yeah, we just start unpacking who they are and give them a chance to explain what they do. So the therapeutic process is very similar to a normal therapeutic process. Mm. When we do a parole assessment, so what we call a risk assessment um, for a parole report, that is quite different. So the offender also needs to be informed that the process is much different. So when we speak about in therapy, what we discuss in therapy remains confidential. So we, we do write a short closing report just highlighting the the main themes that were addressed um, and if there's specific areas that we feel the offender might still improve on. But the content generally remains confidential. When we do a risk assessment, that changes because the sole purpose of, of our intervention at that point or our interaction is to give feedback to the parole board about risks. So there we do a quite in-depth interview. I prefer to do at least two or three interviews with the offender of about between 90 minutes to two and a half hours each. The initial interview, we just look at background, who the offender is, personality, Mm -hmm. uh, strengths, kind of just getting a sense of who they are. The second interview, I work a little bit more on the actual crime and the crime commission, criminal record, behavior within the in the prison programs that they've done so everything that's happened since the crime was committed Mm -hmm. during incarceration and then I have an idea of of who the offender is after that I will write start writing my report I also try to find as much collateral as possible so if I can find court documents court files newspaper articles Sometimes I phone family members if there's victim statements, so I contact the police. So I get as much collateral information as possible and I start going through that. I start writing the report. Mm -hmm. Then often there's questions that I realize I didn't ask or things that I'm now wondering about or things that came up or discrepancies from what the offender has told me. And then I will go back a third time and we'll clarify those discrepancies, fill in the gaps where I feel I don't have enough information. Then I'll finalize the report. And I will, I will give them feedback on that report before I submit it. So even, even if it's not a favorable report, I will tell them this is the reason why it's not favorable. So these are the things that is still worrying factors and things that you might yeah. want to address um, before you go to the parole board again. Um, so all in all, I see them for three or four times and then submit a report. But they are informed that the information in that is not confidential. So everything we discuss in those sessions goes into the report or has the potential to go into the report. Working as a clinical psychologist in the criminal justice system is very different from working in the private sector. I asked Zibeth to outline for us how those two roles are different and how she as a psychologist and person has changed through working in a correctional services setting. Um, I think where working in DCS or in the criminal justice system differs from working in private practice is the profile of our patients. In correctional services, we have quite a disproportionate presence of 
personality disorders, so especially cluster B personality disorders, which includes histrionic, borderline, but then obviously most importantly our narcissistic and antisocial personalities. So quite a large chunk of our treatment population have those personality dynamics present, which does bring about its own challenges. In private practice, you won't necessarily see that many personality disorders. What we often see in private practice is more the people related to those personality disorders. So you would see the wife of a narcissistic husband or children coming from from parent who has some kind of personality disorder. We do see a lot of borderline personality and histrionic in private practice as well, but especially when we look at our narcissistic and antisocial, you might see them in couples therapy, so a husband and wife coming for, for couples therapy. But in general, it's not disproportionately distributed in the private practice as such. So I think that is the major difference. In terms of how I've changed, I think I've learned a lot in terms of how to to deal with the offenders and actually how to address the criminogenic need. In South Africa, we don't have a forensic registration category, which means that although we have in some training programs, you have some exposure to, to what forensic psychology is, mm. we aren't trained specifically in terms of rehabilitation of offenders or intervention in specific offending categories. So those things you have to learn on the job. Yeah. Um, so I've, I've spent quite a lot of time and effort trying to attend workshops and courses and reading up on your overseas programs in dealing with specific offending categories. So those aren't things that you would learn outside or in private mm -hmm. practice, because generally you won't need that. So that I think is the, is the, main, the main concern mm -hmm. or the main difference between private and working yeah. in, in correctional environment. And then obviously working in a system where psychology doesn't naturally fit into. So if we think about private practice or even government owned practices like healthcare or social development, mental health care, psychology has quite an established place there. So it's quite easy to find your feet and people know what a psychologist does. So if you work in a multidisciplinary team, for example, at a, at a hospital or a mental health facility, people kind of know what your role is. Where in other government branches, and I think it's not just DCS, I think if we look at the South African National Defense Force, SAPS, DCS, it's not an environment where psychology fits into naturally. Because the environment is a lot more security and um, protection orientated. So a lot of people don't really understand psychology and they don't really understand the process. So there's also a, a, a way of having to do some psychoeducation about what, how we can contribute and what type of offenders they can send to us and, and what our role can be for these offenders. So you kind of have to adjust to a system where you don't fit into naturally, uh, but it's not, the system doesn't kick you out. Mm. It's just a different way of interacting with the system than what you would in private practice or in the Department of Health or in mental health care in general. So naturally, in these kinds of settings, security is going to take precedence over the mental health of offenders, as well it should. But I also mentioned to Zibeth that I think the work that she does also plays a role in maintaining the security of a prison. Perhaps if offenders are receiving psychological treatment, they would be less likely to act out or disrupt the environment. Here's what she had to say. I also think yeah, there's, there's also a, a difference. People, people don't necessarily understand mental health um, and forensic mental health within that. So there's also a big distinction that should be made between behavior that stems from mental health or mental illness and just behavioral problems mm -hmm. because we also have that and they can't necessarily be managed in exactly the same way mm -hmm. so someone with behavioral problems can't be problems can't be medicated away True. where someone with yeah. with a mental health or a mental illness mm -hmm. might medication might help in terms of the behavior although a lot of skills are still needed mm -hmm. um, but also distinguishing between what is mental health or mental illness and what is then just behavioral problems yeah. 
I find it super interesting, if not surprising, that such a large chunk of our offender population are presenting with personality disorders. It got me thinking that someone like Zibeth, who has had so much hands-on experience with these personality disorders, despite her young age, is probably already more advanced in her knowledge base than most psychologists in private practice. Yeah, I think I would have a little bit more hands-on experience of personality disorders. I wouldn't necessarily, um, necessarily better at diagnosing them or sure. treating them, yeah. but I think I am quite comfortable working with, mm. with them. So they, they do sometimes cause a bit of discomfort, especially for novice therapists. Mm. I think as you mature into the, into the um, career or the occupation, you, you learn how to deal with them. But novice therapists are often caught quite unguarded and they often fall for the manipulation. Mm. Um, I'm not saying that I'm not manipulated. No, 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 I think no. I'm, I'm still human. So, yeah, um, But you learn to, to notice the manipulation a lot earlier in the process. And sometimes you use it, sometimes you work with it. Mm. Um, it's not always beneficial to just block it from the start or react to it. Sure. Um, but I do think sometimes you, you notice some of the manipulation mainly because you're also on the lookout for it. Mm. When private practice, you, you trust that that person is coming to you because they have a, a need for, for therapy. Where in correctional services, you always have to, in the back of your mind, keep the fact that they might only be there for secondary gain. So not primarily because they want to address the problem, but that doesn't mean that you can't work with them and it doesn't mean you can't work with, with the problems at hand. Mm. You just sometimes have to go about that in a roundabout way. I can only imagine that Zibeth deals with some very interesting characters in her job. So I asked her what, if any, specific situations she's dealt with that stand out from her career so far. Keep in mind that for ethical reasons, she cannot share any information that provides identifying characteristics of her patients. Um, yeah, I think <laughs> there's always many, many situations that you can think back to. Some of them you think back about how you could have handled the situation maybe differently. But some of them are also quite entertaining when you think back about it. Offenders can be very creative um, for the reasons they present to therapy. I, for example, had an offender long while ago and he they don't like the prison food so they always try to get some some different diet or something special added to to their food because they don't like it it also becomes quite repetitive because it's the same type of food week after week it's not a variety of food so he came to me and he said to me like he doesn't want to eat eggs anymore and can't i change his diet so i said to him well it's not really what i do and i explained to him what the psychologist does I said, so the only person who can really change your diet is if the doctor makes the recommendation. And the only way we can do that is if there's a specific allergy or if they need a special diet, for example, if there's diabetes or some health issue where they need a special diet. That's the only reason we can really change a diet. So then he tells me, no, ma'am, but you have to help me because every time I eat an egg, I hear a small little chicken in my ear. So clearly linking the fact that he needs a new diet to something that psychology does, which is he hears voices. And I just laughed at him and I said to him, you are almost now not telling me the truth. And he said, well, ma'am, I had to try. (laughs) So some of of the incidences are quite quite entertaining. Um, So yeah, I really enjoy them. They they are very creative Mm -hmm. and yeah, you just work with that. Um, But I also think if I have to pick a, a situation that stands out is I've always wanted to go into the forensic side of things. So when I was in my master's year, when I was doing my master's, we actually had a week of forensic psychology with Prof. Daplo. So he is also a very renowned psychologist who works in the forensic field. But while we were doing our master's, the Valcom graveyard killings were quite in the news um, and it had just happened. So he was asked to evaluate, um, especially Charnay for court. And he then said that he will do it, but that we should join. So we actually had the opportunity to attend or actually look how he does his process. 
and work with that and, you know, go through the reports and how things work. So that was actually for me quite interesting. And it's, um, it's become quite an integral part of you know, my journey into, into psychology and working with, with offenders. I covered the murder of Michael van Eck that Zibeth refers to here in episode 26. One of the perpetrators, Shane van Heerden, was the first female to be declared a highly dangerous offender in South Africa. I can only imagine that being able to sit in on an assessment of such an offender would have made an enormous impression for someone interested in the psychology of offenders. I've always held a certain amount of scepticism about the possibility of rehabilitation for some types of criminals, and certainly we see in some cases that the likes of Gerard Labaskachny or Mickey Pistorius would actually testify to the poor possibility of rehabilitation in certain serial murderers, for instance, especially where the crimes are very closely linked to sexual fantasy. I asked Elizabeth about her professional views on the likelihood of rehabilitation of different types of offenders. I think, I think it's really difficult to classify them by type. So just from, from research, we know that our paedophiles are one of our really difficult populations to, to rehabilitate, purely because it's so difficult to access the, the cognitive content that drives the offending mm. because it is so shameful and they feel quite guilty about it. So that is, that is one of our particularly difficult groups. It's not saying that they can't be rehabilitated, but it does take quite a lot of effort and a lot of time mm-hmm. and long-term therapy. So it's not just where you can see them for five or six times. So if, if you really work in terms of those things, that takes quite a while. Mm-hmm. Um, but in essence, I think I have to believe that majority of our offenders can be rehabilitated. But I do think we do need a lot more resources to really make a massive impact. A bigger problem for me is that we all speak about the fact that offenders need to be rehabilitated and of course they should. Mm. But I think most importantly is that there actually needs to be a a large scale societal rehabilitation that needs to happen Um, for a couple of reasons. I think first of all if we can identify them much much earlier in the cycle we can intervene before it becomes a problem. Um, by the time they reach a prison facility, they have should have gone through a lot of other resources. So there should have been social development interventions. We can identify risk factors in children. Mm. So there, there has been a lot of opportunity up until that time to intervene. Mm. Um, but because all of our resources are overburdened, a lot of these kids slip through the cracks from a young age. I mean, there, there's just not resources to, to intervene for all of them. Yeah. So I think in terms of societal rehabilitation, rehabilitating them or finding these guys much earlier mm-hmm. in the journey um, and intervening, that would potentially help. Mm-hmm. Obviously, we need more resources within prison itself. The more rehabilitative resources we have, the more in-depth our interventions can be because our caseload would be a lot yeah. lighter. Yeah. But then also just in terms of we can send offenders out and they might have been rehabilitated in prison, yeah. but when they get back to communities, the society hasn't rehabilitated. Society hasn't changed. Yeah. So they go back to a society that's gang infested where all the social problems still exist someone who has a matric certificate without a criminal record can't get a decent job Mm. not many people are prepared to give someone with a criminal record a chance and a job so even if we rehabilitate them in prison Mm. the chances for relapse is so great because they they don't have another way of making a living so i think if we really want to impact on our crime statistics in south africa is that we are going to have to intervene on your economic level, a sociopolitical and educational level to change the society we're sending these guys back to. Crimes are becoming more and more violent. And a lot of people will say, but, you know, they can take the phone, but why is it necessary to be so violent in it? And I think just the reality of that is that they 
grow up in these very violent circumstances, many of our offenders, not all of them, but a lot of them come from communities where violence is openly committed in the streets. So they, they are, for them it becomes, that is the norm. It doesn't make it right, it doesn't, doesn't excuse what they do. But I do think the rehabilitation efforts is expected at the end of the line to be correctional services. But if we go back to the communities, there actually needs massive reform in our communities and our social system mm. to ultimately address the crime problem in South Africa. I think that is one of the best explanations of the problem we face that I've ever heard. We continuously lament the fact that crime levels are growing and it's becoming more and more violent. But we somehow separate ourselves and the society we've helped to build from that. We assume that this is someone else's problem to solve. And really, if we want to get down to the roots of it, it's not someone else's problem. It's everyone's problem. If you don't want a criminal working with you or living next door to you, then don't ignore the child that lives next door to you today that's being horrifically abused by their parents. Take action. Because today a child lives next door to you and tomorrow when they've grown up in a violent environment and violence is normal to them and they've received no assistance, they will be the criminal living next door to you and then it will be your problem. And of course, we had to discuss the question that is always on everyone's mind. What about rehabilitating someone with psychopathic traits? I think another category of offenders that's really difficult to, to work with is those with psychopathic traits. And it doesn't mean that we can't work with them, but they are, especially for novice therapists, they give them quite a run around. Even for me, it's really difficult to, to work with them and to build enough trust to, to work. And for me, a, a main problem with, or a main difficulty with working with, with those with severe antisocial personality and psychopathic traits is that often when we intervene in traditional psychological ways, we are actually making them better at what they do. So if we work on insight and, you know, emotional, you're know, obtaining emotions, they are master mimickers, so they just learn to do that better wow. um, instead of actually really integrating that into themselves. It becomes a bit of a challenge because if, if they've been really psychologized, you're never really certain if what they're saying is just for show. But even, even with um, those with psychopathic traits, is to we can still teach them some skills. So we can t- still teach them social skills. So even though they might not inherently change their behavior can change because not all of those with psychopathic traits are in prison some of them are quite successful in society so we can change the the behavior in terms of skills but it does take a lot of effort and obviously we need the offender to want to change but that is also a quite a difficult population to intervene with so how interesting is that and of course it makes total sense People with psychopathic traits tend to spend most of their lives watching and learning how they're expected to react. They instinctively know that their natural reaction to things is not what others expect. So they learn from those around them about what reactions are acceptable and do their best to mimic those. And what better person to learn from about a so-called healthy mind and behaviour patterns than a psychologist. Like I said to Zibeth, I could do an entire interview with her just on people with psychopathic traits. I can't imagine how difficult it must be to deal with situations like this on a daily basis, even though it is sort of what you signed up for. I'm always interested to know how people working in these fields are personally impacted by what they see and hear. Here's what Zibeth had to say about that. I think while you are busy dealing with it, you don't always realise the impact directly. 
I think once you start taking steps back, you do realize that, you know, these things are quite horrendous. Um, I think sometimes I forget that it's not just normal to speak about these things in conversations and people would be quite shocked. Even though you've grown accustomed to quite graphic details of things, not everybody is like that. So like, for example, not everybody speaks very openly about things like child sexual offending and pedophiles and very horrendous um, violent offenses. But for me, it has become quite, well, obviously when I speak to an offender, I can't, I can't appear shocked when I speak to them. So you, you kind of accustomed to that. But I think what helps me a lot is the way I view the offender. So if I can view them as more than what they've done, so more than just their behavior, it helps me to process the, the details of the crimes better. Where solution focused therapy helps a lot because then you, you kind of see the person behind the prisoner. So how I normally go about when I see an offender is I don't, I try not to know too much about them before meeting them the first time. So I don't read all of their files. I don't go through everything. So I give them the opportunity to meet me on their, on their turf. So I get to know the person. And then in a one or two or three sessions after that, we will start getting into the crime and I will see what's going on in terms of his sentence. But initially, I just give them a chance to tell me who they are. So without me having that preconception of this is a child sexual offender or this is someone who's committed so many murders or who's done this. Um, so getting the, to know the person behind it. It's not always possible because obviously we do have cases that's been in the media a lot. So then you have a background to the case. But then I still try and give them a fair chance, get to, to know the person and not just speak about the offence straight from, from the get go. It must be quite a mind blowing moment when Zibeth meets a person for a few sessions and then goes back and actually reads about the crimes they've been convicted of. I asked her if she's sometimes surprised by how the person and the crime just don't correlate. I think sometimes reflecting, well, when you start to get to know what they've actually done, you sometimes can't believe that this person has committed that crime. So yeah, it's, it, it has taught me not to judge a book by its cover. So, but you're yeah, judging a person for who they are, not just based on, on a single behavior. Um, I have a, my life motto is to, if, if you treat someone as if they are what they are supposed to be, then you can help them become that person. Um, so if, I, if I'm treating you like the worst part of yourself, I can't really expect you to be better. But if I'm treating you like the best part of yourself, um, we can work towards you obtaining that. I really think that we are very lucky to have someone like Zibeth working with South African offenders. It cannot be easy to take the stance, and it would be much easier to slip into a judgmental role. But I really do agree with her outlook. When I started this podcast, I honestly felt like people were either good or bad. And I've come to realize that's not true. We all have a little bit of both in us. Some of us just act on it and get caught. Others act on it and don't get caught. And still others don't act on our darkness in a way that's at least considered illegal. But that still doesn't make it right. And the reverse is true too. Very soon I'm going to be covering a case in which a huge part of the public thinks that it is impossible that the person convicted actually committed the crimes. Even I spent a good amount of time watching this person's trial and thinking, it just can't be. Is it really possible? And the answer is, yes, it's entirely possible. Because just like the people that sit in Zibeth's office on a daily basis, 99% of what these people are and what their external life reflects, is not their crime. We see the guy that helps his sister with his homework, or buys his mom flowers on Mother's Day, and there's just no way that that guy could be the same person that takes their lives, right? But it can, and it is. <laughs> 
violent crimes are a snapshot of a moment in time, and those snapshots very often do not line up with the rest of that person's life. Zibeth had more to say about how understanding an offender's background helps her to be a more empathetic psychologist and person. Yeah, and I also think if you if you get to know the person and you get to know their background, you sometimes have a little bit more empathy for what they've gone through. So you've done Booty Boot on your on your podcast and if you if you've listened to Stuart's upbringing and just where he came from, like you kind of have a little bit more empathy regardless of the very horrific things that he's done. Um, you know, there is a part of you that feels that the system has failed him in so many ways, getting to that point where he committed these crimes. Not saying that if we intervened, he definitely wouldn't have committed it. Sure. But yeah, I think when you when you listen to these offenders and you get to know them, you know, they all everybody has a story. Um, and I always tell them is that your story doesn't, it doesn't excuse what you've done. And we're never going to say what you've done wasn't terrible or hasn't hurt people but we need to focus on that you are more than that so I think that that is a way to help that helps me cope Um, and I also think really helps is the fact that um, in the Western Cape we are quite a few psychologists within DCS and I also have previous colleagues from from previous prisons where I've worked where you know if things get really bad or you're really stuck on someone or you're really struggling to to process some of the information Mm. there is always a space to share that with a colleague which would still be confidential and just helps you process that a little bit so that that also helps us to have a colleague who works in the same environment and who understands the struggles and the difficulties so that you don't get caught up in it because i think it's so easy to get caught up in the details and and terrible things that you sometimes lose empathy for for them. Um, So it's it's good to just get a little bit perspective in in that Mm. sense. And I know that's something we often struggle with after some of the cases I cover, like the Stuart Wilkins and the Moses Satolis, who had horrific childhoods. We sometimes feel like if we feel empathy for who those people were as children and what they went through, that we're somehow excusing their choices as adults. And that's not the case. I think it's entirely possible to feel both empathy for the things these people experienced that they couldn't control and simultaneously not excuse the choices that they made that ended up hurting others and continuing the cycle of violence. And I think the, the difference there is to, to separate the person from the behaviour. So we can not condone the behaviour, but it doesn't mean that we can't feel empathy and get to know the person. Um, I mean, we, we all do bad things. We all do things that we regret. And just because you've done something that you regret doesn't make you a bad person necessarily. So I think in in separating the behavior from the person and speaking about the behavior not as the same way we do with mental health. So we don't speak about, you know, the schizophrenic. We speak about someone suffering from schizophrenia because we separate the disorder from the person. And I think in the same way, I do that when I work with offenders. So I don't necessarily speak about the murderer that I saw. I'm speaking about someone who's committed a murder. That way, it just helps to kind of see the two separately and not integrate them and intertwine them completely but it's not denying the crime and it's not denying the seriousness of the offences. I very often get asked by people how they can work in fields related to psychology and criminal behaviour and I think it's very important for this to be clarified by someone actually in the field. So I asked Elizabeth to share the reality of the term forensic psychology with us and clarify exactly what roles psychologists play in this field. Just to clarify, I think a lot of people in South Africa talk about forensic psychologists and being a forensic psychologist or, you know, wanting to go into forensic psychology. So I think just in terms of ethical to clarify that is that we don't actually have anything like a forensic psychologist in South Africa. 
So when we register, you have to register in one of the existing categories, which means clinical psychology, counseling psychology, educational psychology. Um, we have research psychology and then we have industrial psychology. And the most recently added category, in, I think it was in October 2019, is neuropsychology. So what you would do is you register into one of those categories. And so you register as, for example, I'm a clinical psychologist working in the forensic field. Um, so that is actually how you're supposed to refer it. So we don't have something like forensic psychology in South Africa. And when we speak about forensic psychology as a profession or as a field, it actually is quite varied. So um, a lot of people see it very differently mm -hmm. and people will do forensic work but never interact with offenders. Mm -hmm. So forensic psychology as a field actually refers to any part where psychology and the law intersects. So that ranges from family court matters, so drawing up custody agreements, parenting plans, visitation rights, anything to do with family court, that is also a field within forensic psychology. We can also deal with things like civil court matters, where you know if someone makes a claim of character defamation and you want to say how much it has affected you psychologically, a psychologist who would work in that field also is also performing forensic work. Then we have medico-legal matters, so where kind of medicine, which includes mental health, um, intersects with, with the legal field. And those would be things, for example, the road accident fund. So if there's road accident fund claims and you claim that this has impacted you so severely emotionally that you can't perform your work, so you've got PTSD, or if there was a brain injury and you're not at your previous level of functioning, that a psychologist would also be involved there. So that would be more medical legal work. Uh, we can also work in the criminal court system. And there we then differentiate into two fields. So you can work with the victims. Mm -hmm. So do victim competency assessments. For example, if someone suffers from a mental disorder or impaired cognitive ability or a young child who needs to testify, and you would then assess if if this person is indeed capable of testifying in court or if that would not be an option and they would rather submit a statement or whatever the case may be. You can do victim impact studies, so taking victim statements and speaking about okay, what has this impacted you. Mm. And that might be used, for example, in the sentencing phase of the crime. And then also assessment of if there's claims of sexual abuse with children, so assessing those children to see if there, if there was a potential uh, sexual violation of children. So working with the victims. And then we have the different fields working with the offenders. And within that, again, there's quite a few branches. So one of those would actually be, and I think you spoke about that in the case of P, and where we look at children and whether they are criminally responsible. So currently we have under 12, you are not criminally responsible. And then between 12 and 14, there is what we call a rebuttal period. So there we have to find out, can this child be held criminally liable for his actions? So how far is his moral development, judgment, intellectual functioning, all of the factors that impact on our ability to make a decision of right and wrong and appreciate the consequences thereof. And I think in the, in the case of P, you said that, you know, we have to understand that children are still developing. But if a child is found not accountable um, for his actions, so saying he's not, he's not yet morally developed enough, so he's not going to be charged, he doesn't have criminal capacity, mm -hmm. and then the children under 12, who is just assumed not to have criminal capacity, it doesn't mean that those children don't get any help. So those children are still helped. They are just diverted away from the criminal justice system. So then either into the mental health care system or into social development system where they would attend programs. So there's like Necro does programs and there's quite a few companies over the country who does programs. They might go into the mental health care system to treat mental conditions that they might have. So it's not that they aren't getting any help. Mm. So we are intervening in those kids. But what we are saying, we're just not diverting them to the criminal justice system, which means they won't have a criminal record.
so that's the one. So that is in terms of the Children's Justice Act. And then the different phases of what we now call adult psychology. So we can be in within the criminal justice system, we can be involved in the investigative phase, mm -hmm. which is what the investigative psychology unit um, mainly does. Um, and it's not profiling like you would see on mm -hmm. TV. Yeah. Um, it's not like criminal minds. Um, but what they do is they interview offenders, they try to get information from offenders that might help in actually resolving a crime, linking certain crime scenes to one specific offender, like an a MO or modus operandi that we will look at. And then they also do court testimonies and pre sentencing reports. But that is basically an investigative phase. Mm. And then we have during the trial phase. So in the initial stages of a trial, if someone is there's questions about his mental capacity or his, his capabilities. He can be sent for a mental health evaluation, and that is under the Criminal Procedure Act, Section 77 to 79. And that is normally when we would say they would go to Falkenberg um, for 30 days observation. And basically the determination there would be, first, if they are accountable for their actions, mm -hmm. and second of all, if they are triable for their actions. So when we look at accountability, it means that at the time of the crime, could they distinguish between right and wrong? And were they able to appreciate the consequences of, of their actions at the time of the crime? So that could come into play, for exa example, someone suffering a psychotic break who wouldn't necessarily be in control of their mental capacity or their mental functionings at the time of, of committing the crime. Mm -hmm. So those guys normally get diverted into the forensic mental health care system. So they become state patients and they are then treated at Falkenberg. When we look at triability, so if they are capable of standing trial at the moment, mm. the main characteristic that we look there for is are they able to understand the court procedures and are they able to give instructions to their lawyers in terms of their defense. Mm. So that might impact if someone is currently psychotic. So he wasn't maybe psychotic at the time of committing the crime, so he's accountable, but he's not triable at the moment because he can't give instructions in his own defense, which means that the trial won't proceed right now. Mm -hmm. That person would go to a mental health facility, he will be treated, but then as soon as he gets healthy, he will be able to stand trial because he has been found accountable. So those are the difference between being mm -hmm. accountable and triable and how the 30-day observation work. Then while the trial is ongoing, we can deliver expert testimony. So you will often see that people coming to speak about, for example, depression or anxiety. We saw some of that in the Oscar Pistorius trial where they spoke about generalized anxiety disorder and the whole country was running wild because now everybody was scared that someone with generalized anxiety was going to attack them. Um, so that is expert testimony. So yeah. that basically just explains what the disorder is, what the characteristics of the disorder is, what we can expect from someone who has this, how to act. Mm -hmm. We can also testify as a witness of fact. So that would be if you have seen someone in therapy um, and they would want to know, you know, how was this person in therapy? So unfortunately, although sessions are confidential, the exception of that is if the court orders you to produce your notes. So it's not like with an attorney, which everything is confidential, yes. but the court can, can order you. So for example, if someone has seen you for therapy for three years and they go on to committing a violent crime, the court might ask you to testify about what has been done in those three years, that they display any yeah. violent tendencies and just kind of get a sense of what was going on. So that is a witness of fact. Then, we can play a role in the sentencing phase of the trial. So there we would kind of see what is going on with this offender and we would make recommendations in terms of sentencing. Examples of that would be in um, Shanae van Yerden's case where they looked at you know, declaring her a dangerous criminal and there would have to be a psychologist report and most probably also a psychiatrist report to say why we consider her particularly dangerous and support the argument that she's a dangerous criminal. Yeah. So in the sentencing phase, we might also write a report for mitigation of sentence. So if someone has committed a crime, but there has been these mitigating factors surrounding that, for example, if someone 
has an intellectual disability. Um, we might say, you know, that even though he is accountable for his actions, he might struggle in prison. So we might look at how can we assist so we, we can write recommendations for sentencing. Yeah. And then obviously then working in the correctional environment when these guys then actually get to the, the correctional wow. end. So those are all, everything of that falls within the forensic field. So it's quite varied from, you know, custody cases all the way to dealing with offenders. Yeah. And that is just forensic psychology is not one thing. Yes. So whenever someone, if someone is in trouble and they want to appoint a psychologist to assist them mm -hmm. in their legal matters, regardless of whether that is in a custody case or in a criminal case, I think the most important thing would be to choose a psychologist who is actually experienced in that particular field. Yeah. So even though I work in the forensic field, yeah. I'm not going to do any custody cases because yeah. I don't have the necessary knowledge and the necessary experience to do that. Sure. So often people think all psychologists do the same work. Yeah. So whenever you go to a psychologist for therapy or for whatever, yeah. always make sure that that psychologist is knowledgeable and experienced in the specific field or the area that you need assistance with. And the other question I get a lot is how someone can become a profiler, which is a field that has become really popular thanks to the various television series around it. So Zibeth clarifies that for us as well. So when we speak about profilers it's a very it's a term used very loosely and i'm speaking also now very loosely because it's it's not completely what i do we often watch all of these hollywood dramatizations of you know criminal minds and mm -hmm. fbi and they always show these people who come up with these amazing profiles of exactly what the person looks like and you know how they're going to be dressed and where we're going to find them yeah. that's not quite how it works um so we can't when we speak about profiling we're actually doing more a profile of a psychological blueprint. Um, so it's a very, very generalized blueprint, but it's not really gonna help you to catch a killer. Mm. Um, it's more going to help you in terms of linking this different behaviors to a specific person after that person has been caught. So profiling, not, not necessarily a job by itself. Yeah. So if you want to go into the investigative psychology unit, where's most of the so-called profiling happens yeah. they actually only have very few psychologists in there i mm. think currently i might i'm speaking under correction but i think there are three in the country at the moment but it's quite or it's a much bigger unit than the three of them mm. they actually train specific detectives and people from the police force who they've identified as you know having certain abilities mm. to do this type of work um, so some of them have honours degrees in psychology, some of them just come through the detective ranks, yeah. but they then have in-service in training, mm -hmm. which we can say. Um, so you don't necessarily have to have a master's in psychology. You can work your way up through the police force, but it is kind of an elite unit. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that is... It's the process of getting there. Yeah. But I can't speak too much about that because I don't know no, all the ins and outs. Yeah, yeah, but profiling in general is not is not a job. It's yes. not a specific yes. thing that you can become. Yeah. Um, it will be form part of the the duties that you that you do in terms of your job. And then just in terms of becoming a psychologist, a lot of people, you know, leave leave matric and they or bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and say, you know, I'm going to be a child psychologist or I'm going to be a forensic psychologist or whatever. Psychology is actually a very <laughs> broad field and it's quite a long journey. So just to get to psychology, so although there are undergraduate degrees, for example, a BA in psychology and uh, marketing, for mm -hmm. example, there's actually no undergraduate psychology degree. Mm -hmm. So what you would do is, you do an undergraduate degree. After you've completed your undergraduate degree, if you do it full time and you pass all your subjects first time around, it's three years. After that, you have to do an honors degree. So honors is you get selected for honors purely based on marks. So every university selects, depending on their capacity, 40, between 40 and 80 students for honors each year. That is purely based on marks. 
there's nothing really else much to it. But then after you've completed your honors, you would have to do a master's degree. Mm -hmm. um, your master's degree would, can be in any of the fields, counseling, clinical, educational, yeah, so neuro. The... Yeah, so now you start specializing. And how that works is quite a rough process, mm -hmm. but you apply to the specific universities where you think you would like to complete your master's. They get a lot of paper applications, they go through that and they would then pick, let's say, 30 people to come for interviews and you would go through a week-long interview process with group interviews, panel interviews, individual interviews, activities, some incorporate psychometry, so quite a rigorous process and from that each university would then select candidates for their master's program. Again, depending on the resources of the university, it's normally between six and ten candidates per university for, for masters. And your masters is then you do a coursework first, so that can be one or two years depending on the university, but it's full time. So it's not something that you can do part time. You can't keep a job and do your master. Mm. So if you're going to commit to a master's, it's full time. Um, and then after your master's, you do an internship year at an accredited site. And then you are qualified. If you take the clinical route, you also need to perform a community service year, or in South Africa is known as a Zuma year. <laughs> so you have to perform that as well. So all in all, it takes about seven years to qualify if you manage to get into master's straight from the start and everything goes well. Most people don't get into master's the first time, so you apply time and time again. But you know, in order to call yourself a psychologist in South Africa, you have to have a professional master's degree. So you've actually had to complete the master's court work, um, coursework and then the master's dissertation, completed your internship, written board exams, and then only are you allowed to call yourself a psychologist. I asked Zibeth, in terms of a young person that decides they want to be a psychologist, what the best route would be for them in terms of subject consideration and the like. People always ask me if they want to be a psychologist, what, what, I, what I would say to them. And I tell them, you know, first of all, there's no guarantee that you're going to make it all the way. The most important thing is that choose an undergraduate degree that you can get a job with. Um, you don't necessarily even have to do a BA degree. You can literally do any undergraduate degree. You can study engineering if you want. Um, as long as you have all of your undergrad psychology modules and some universities also require you to have the research undergrad modules. So as long as you have those core subjects, so um, you can study anything which means that if, if the process don't go smoothly and you get mm. selected straight out of honours, yeah. you can at least do something to get an income while you are continuing to try get into your master's degree. You, ca you can't really do something with just your, your undergraduate or honours degrees. So um, for some people, if you do an honours that's a B-Psych equivalent, mm. you can do some practical hours, so six months or 720 hours of practicals, and then you can register as either a psychometrist or a counsellor, which some people take that route, but you have to make sure that the honours degree is a B-Psych equivalent degree to, to be able to do that. So not all of the honours degrees are necessarily accredited. So my advice would be, if you want to go into the field of, of psychology, uh, before you embark on the journey, speak to someone in the field to just kind of get an idea because most universities, if they hear you want to be a psychologist or you want to study psychology, they advise you to do a BA, um, which is perfectly fine. Yeah. Um, but just make sure that that your your the BA that you choose has some avenue that has earning potential yeah. should you not be able to get into master straight away. Now, don't let this discourage you if you have an interest in any of these fields. You don't need to be a qualified clinical psychologist to partake in a career that stimulates your interest in the field of the criminal mind or anything related. I'm a pretty good example of that. <laughs> 
There are many ways to get involved in these fields at any stage of your life that don't require you to study for seven years. I do think it's super important for Zibeth to have shared this reality with us, though, because I think it's something that so many people do not fully research or understand before embarking on a journey into the field of psychology, and it's important to go into it with all the facts. Another aspect of convictions and the justice system that I've wanted to clarify with someone informed in those fields for a long time are the concepts of bail and parole. Thankfully, Zibeth's work brings her in close contact with these concepts regularly, and she agreed to explain how both bail and parole work in South Africa. Yeah, so to discuss or just to inform people that I hear a lot of confusion and people don't always understand bail and parole as as concepts in general. So with regards to bail, there's a lot of misconceptions in the public. So a lot of things I hear is, you know, why can someone who commits a murder get 500 rand bail and someone who, you know, commit a theft sometimes get 10,000 rand bail. So people don't really understand how, how the concept of bail works. So when we look at bail, bail just means that after you've been arrested, you might have been charged, you would have been charged and you would have gone to court. But it's just to determine on whether you can be outside while you are awaiting trial. So your trial hasn't really commenced, which means under South African law, you are still innocent. You are presumed innocent. So bail isn't supposed to be a punishment or a sanction. Bail is supposed to be surety that you will be attending your court hearings. So bail is not determined based on the offence you committed. It sometimes plays a little bit of a role, but bail is actually determined based on what would be a significant enough amount to ensure that you will come back to court. So once the court proceedings have been finalised and you've either been acquitted or sentenced, that bail money gets paid back. So that is the only reason for bail. So bail is just a surety. So if you earn 50,000 rand a month, your bail is going to be much higher, regardless of the offence you committed, than someone who earns 1,000 rand a month. Um, Because it just needs to be a significant enough amount to ensure that you come back. And how bail works is for less serious offences, Bail is actually presumed, so we expect for you to get bail for less serious offences. The responsibility would be for the state to prove that you are either a danger for the community or a flight risk for you to be denied bail. Um, So if you have a very extensive previous record, you might be denied bail because you are considered a danger to society. Whereas with our more serious offences, The assumption is that you won't be getting bail and it would be on the side of the defense Mm. to convince the court that you aren't a danger and that you aren't a flight risk. So that would be in the case of murder and rape. The the presumption is that you won't be getting bail. Mm. But if we have like, for example, in the Jason Ruder case, we know that they were out on bail Mm. and that is just that they said, you know, he has got enough assets here to keep him here he's not a flight risk his family is here he won't flee he will come back to prison um, or to, to court you would be subjected to certain bail conditions which means that you have to report to the police station you're not allowed to be mixing with witnesses you're not allowed to interfere with investigation and whatever the court deems necessary um, as part of your bail conditions If you fail to comply with those bail conditions, the bail will be revoked and you will be remanded in awaiting trial custody for the duration of your trial. So that is bail in short. So I hope that clarifies to Mm. people why some people get a very large sum and some a smaller sum for what seems to be not related to the the crime. So bail is not a punishment. Um, It's just a surety. Mm. When we get to parole. That means this offender has been found guilty. He served a certain 
amount of time or portion of his sentence. And it was deemed that he has been rehabilitated enough mm -hmm. to be sent back into the community. So the time to be served differs, and we can discuss that a little bit more in detail. But what that means is that when you are released, you still serve the remainder of your sentence, but there's also certain conditions that apply. If you break any of those conditions, you are remanded back into custody. So you are rearrested, you are brought back to prison, and you have to serve the remainder of your sentence or a significant time again before you will be up for consideration again. And then one thing I always hear people say when we speak about parole is that someone is applying for parole. So that is a very televised American Hollywood presumption. So in South Africa, an offender doesn't apply for parole. According to the law, after a certain portion of his sentence, he automatically becomes eligible for consideration. Um, so what that means is just after that eligibility time has arrived, or what we call a minimum detention period, when that has arrived, they can then from there see the parole board and a decision can be made on whether this is a good candidate or not. Um, after he's become eligible, he ne legally needs to be seen periodically. So the parole board can then either say they'll see him in six months again or in a year's time again. Not sure what the maximum time is that they can give for a, a next consideration date. Okay. But so an offender doesn't apply for parole. They become automatically eligible and according to law, they have to be seen on those prescribed times and then periodically thereafter. So if an offender is declined parole when they become eligible, the parole board decides when they will next be considered. So the parole board will say six months further profile, which means after six months they would be seen. Mm -hmm. And that's normally if there's things that they're not quite satisfied with. So for example, if there's not a positive address. So we can't just send someone out to live on the streets. Mm -hmm. We need someone to sign for them to say that they can live with me and I'll take some responsibility for them and their actions. Um, so there needs to be a positive address. Mm -hmm. The address can't be close to the victim unless the victim has said that it's fine, they can come back to that specific address. So there's a lot of conditions that apply. So sometimes there's small things outstanding and they will get a six months further profile. Sometimes there's concerns about that he's not fully rehabilitated mm -hmm. and they will refer him for either for psychological treatment or for treatment yeah. programs with the social worker. And then they'll say, a year from now, we'll see you again once the pro these programs have been finalised. Another thing that, that I wanted to get clarity on, and also that Zibeth had noticed that there was confusion around, is sentences. There's a very wide variety of sentences um, under the Criminal Procedure Act. So I'm, I'm briefly going to touch on, on just the minor sentences, sure. um, and then I'll kind of ho hover a little bit with the life sentences and just explain what exactly a life sentence is mm. and what it means to be serving a life sentence. Um, so probably the least restrictive type of sentence that a court can impose on you, sometimes you are just released with a warning. Mm. Okay, so sometimes you go through the court, court says you are guilty, but we are just warning you. Mm. But then you can have a correctional supervision sentence mm which is basically what is known as house arrest. Mm. Um, and as part of that, we can say, you know, they need to perform a certain amount of community service hours. So that's a correctional supervision sentence. That means they never actually physically go to prison. From the court, they are released to what we call community corrections. Mm -hmm. So it's part of the Department of Correctional Services, but it, that's also the people who monitor those that's on parole. So they get released into their custody and then either... Um, are placed under house arrest or then and or have to perform community service. Then we get fines. So we get two type of fines and most of us have been fined. So speeding <laughs> fines is also a, a, a fine sentence. Mm. So normally when you get a fine, there's always the option. So there's the option of getting a fine or paying the fine or serving a specific amount of jail time. Mm. So it would be, for example, a 3,000 rand fine or 90 days in prison or whatever the court may decide. So you then either have the option of paying the fine 
and you are free to go and live your life or you say I don't have the money to pay the fine so then you have to to do the the 90 days in prison mm. if those the days that you get or the months that you get is less than five years what happens is as soon as you are in the correctional services system mm. we try and process you out as quickly as possible so if you get a fine or less than five years the presumption is that it's not necessarily a serious offense so what happens is that sentence is then converted to a correctional supervision sentence so you are placed on correctional supervision so but it still comes on your criminal record as a fine mm. um, or then days in prison but they are processed out as soon as possible okay. and then they have a lot of parole conditions to apply um, or to comply with mm. you can also get a fine but then the prison term is more than five years so you might get a six-year sentence so either for example a 20,000 rand fine or six years imprisonment mm -hmm. if the sentence is more than five years um, you are considered for parole after you've served one quarter of that sentence okay. um, so for example if it's an eight-year sentence then after serving two years you will be considered for parole mm -hmm. the reason for that is when we think of a fine it's normally less serious crime so it might be damage of property mm. sometimes small amounts of for example abalone so it, it's it's less serious offenses it's it's not violent offenses yes. um, it relates more to either economical offenses or then um, non-violent or non non-contact offenses so you they they normally get considered for parole after two years doesn't mean they get placed on parole mm. but the consideration is after serving one quarter of their sentence then we also have those who are sentenced under a different section of the law mm -hmm. um, well not a different section but a different part so those are what we call under section 276 1 i so regardless of the sentence you receive those offenders after having served at least one sixth of the sentence mm -hmm. and if they have less than five years of the sentence left they can also be converted to correctional supervision so which means after one sixth of of your sentence has been served it gets converted and you are placed on correctional supervision or parole that is also usually our less serious offenses but if we think about a crime that has been in the news about that is and this is this is why oscar went out after serving having served 10 months because he was sentenced i think he got a six-year sentence initially mm. or five-year sentence five-year sentence but he was sentenced under 276 one i which meant that after 10 months he had become eligible for parole consideration because it was one sixth of his sentence um, and it was then converted to correctional supervision which means house arrest mm. and other parole conditions the state then appealed and it got converted to a normal correctional sentence which we'll get to now um, and then they had to serve the amount required okay. for for that sentence okay. so those are after one six of mm. a sentence most most of our offenders are sentenced under section 276 one b and that is the the usual you know, most most of them work according to that they have to serve at least half of their sentence so if you have a 10-year sentence you will become eligible for parole consideration after five years um, and then from there you will be monitored and mm. further profile will be given until you are deemed suitable for parole if you have a sentence of less than two years so less than 24 months mm -hmm. the head of the correctional center is actually the one making the decision to place you out on parole and you only ha they only have to serve a quarter of their sentence so if you have two year sentence you have to serve at least six months and then the head of the center can make a decision regarding parole anything more than two years you have to serve half and the parole board is the one making the decision and then we have our more serious offenses um, and there's 
three types of, offend, of sentences that we can, can get there. So they are under section 286A, mm -hmm. which is our habitual criminals. So those are normally guys with a lot of short sentences. So they are kind of just habitual criminals, but it's mm -hmm. normally a lot of petty theft. So consistently coming back into the system for stealing, for damage to property, for oh, okay. like minor assault, but a lot of short sentences, but continuously. Mm -hmm. So what happens then is that the state can then argue that this person must be declared a habitual criminal. So regardless of the, the crime they are being um, tried for, mm -hmm. if the court then decides that yes, they are a habitual criminal, they will get an, a 15 year sentence and they will have to serve at least half of the 15 years before becoming eligible for parole. Then we have the 286B cases, mm -hmm. and those are what we know as our dangerous criminals. So they have indeterminate sentences, which means that there's not an ending date to their sentence. Okay. So they are like the Shanae van Yerdens. Mm -hmm. They are sentenced as dangerous persons, and the court will give a number of years after which they have to return to court, and the court will then decide on what type of sentence this person needs. So, yeah, there we have a few in our system and a few who's been back to court and has come back with a further three years to go back to court. Um, so, but the court will, once these people return, decide on whether whatever sentence would be needed for them at the moment. Okay. And then we have our life um, sentences, our lifers. So, in 2004, our sentencing or the law regarding sentencing and parole changed. So we have life is in our system that fall under different categories. Mm -hmm. If a person has committed a crime and have been sentenced for that crime, and it happened before March of 1994, those guys are considered for parole after they've served at least 10 years. So, but now if you think this happened before 1994, we still have some of those guys in our system um, who hasn't, hasn't been placed on parole. But if you fall into that, that category of offenders, you have to serve two years on parole. So after you've been released from prison, you then have to serve an additional two years on parole. So, but those guys are, they've been in prison yeah. since forever mm. and so they've committed their crime before 1994 they might have been sentenced after that but if the crime happened before 1994 mm. they have to serve at least 10 years and then we have a next next category of lifers and those are the guys who have committed their crimes before September 2004 so they also might have been sentenced after that but the crime happened before September 2004. So these guys have to serve at least half of their sentence. So 12, 12 and a half years of their 25 year life sentence okay. before they can be considered for parole. Um, when they are considered for parole, doesn't mean they get placed on parole, but they just come up for consideration because that's the law. And then from there on, they have to be periodically reviewed. And then we have majority of our life offenders and those are everyone who's committed a crime after September 2004 and have received a life sentence they have to serve a minimum of 25 years in prison so they can only be considered for parole after 25 years so they can't be considered earlier than that unless it's for someone who's a older offender mm. so someone of the age of 65 mm. but they would have have to complete it at least 15 years and then they can be considered after the age of 65 for for parole or then if we are granting them medical parole for a chronic or a terminal illness mm. so those are the only way that someone with a 25 year sentence for a crime after 2004 can become eligible for parole earlier than the 25 years once you are placed on parole you are on parole for life so which means that 
even another 25 years from now, if you don't apply or comply with your parole conditions, you will come back to prison. Um, so you're never really free from the law. So you will consistently be for the rest of your life under parole conditions um, that you have to comply with, which means regular check-ins at the uh, community corrections, mm -hmm. regular check-ins there. You have to, you can't just go on holiday. You can't move from your house without notifying um, DCS. So quite quite restrictive even once you are released. For those guys with current life sentences, mm -hmm. we don't have to send you out after the 25 years. Um, so if you are not deemed a good candidate, you will stay beyond the 25 years. So we have people in our system who has been in prison since the 80s and they are still in prison because they aren't deemed suitable candidates. Um, so it's not necessary that if you, re if you have a life sentence and you reach the minimum detention period that we have to send you out. Mm. The other thing with lifers is that it's not the parole board who makes a decision. Mm. It gets sent to the Minister of Correctional Services and he is actually the one who makes a decision on whether this guy is suitable for parole. And yeah, there's a lot of reports that comes in psychology mm. Um, amongst those so we do a risk assessment but then also reports from all the other role players within DCS to comment on rehabilitation and behavior and any problems that there might be for this offender or if mm. the guy has made some good progress that would also be mentioned um, but that's basically how a life sentence works. So I am really glad that I do not work on a parole board in South Africa right now because imagine trying to keep all of those different categories straight. Elizabeth would tell me there are not very many of the first category, the pre-94 offenders, left in the system. Many of them have either died or been released on parole. But interestingly, she did say that we should keep in mind that many of the pre-94 offenders that are still in the system were actually initially given death sentences that were commuted to life when the death penalty was abolished in South Africa. There are more of the pre-2004 offender class still in the system, but they too will eventually all have been phased out, and we will only be left with the final class of offenders, the post-2004 offenders that are required to serve 25 years. That class of offender is also kept in maximum security for 12 and a half years, and then they are considered for movement to medium class security facilities for the next 12 and a half years. A concept that I came across in the Baines Kluwerf murder case is one of victim offender dialogue, and this is also a topic that Zibeth was quite keen to provide information on as it's quite an important part, not only of the rehabilitation process, but it also helps to provide more healing for the victims in certain situations. So we have two, two processes within DCS. The one is what we call victim offender mediation, VOMs, and that is normally just mediating the relationship between the offender and their families again because mm. their own families are also what we call secondary victims mm. they also go through the trauma and they are sometimes is ostracized by the community so it's kind of rebuilding that and for the victim once he has insight into the crime you know to apologize for his actions once he realizes how how it affects his family yeah. um, so that is the vom process um, we do that quite often Social work is quite, quite good with, with those things. So if you have family in prison and that's something that you would be interested in, you can contact the centre where they are and you can say that you would like a VOM consultation. Okay. And we will prepare the offender. We have people who pre prepare the family. And then we have a sit down with various, we have a facilitator, we have people to support there. And it's just an open, honest discussion. Mm -hmm. The but the family has chance to ask to ask questions that they they wonder about. Um, it's also the opportunity for the for the offender to come clean to his family about what has been going on, and then we have the victim offender dialogues. 
the VODs, mm -hmm. which is a lot more sensitive in nature because that would be where we actually get the, the primary victims in. So either the primary victim or the family of the primary victim. And again, it's a very sensitive process. And I think this is also something that victims aren't always aware of, um, that they, they actually have the right and they, they can ask to, to confront the, the offender if they would like to. Yeah. So ideally, um, we have victim tracers at DCS who try and trace the victims because sometimes we don't know who the victims are. We don't have their their details. So we have victim tracers who really do their best to, to trace the, the victims. And then we would contact them. Well, someone from DCS will contact them yeah. and ask if they would be interested in sitting down with the offender. And again, they would then have the chance to ask the questions that they didn't necessarily get the answers to mm -hmm. when in court. Ideally, we would want to do that for all contact crimes. But it isn't always viable. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes the victims can't come. Yeah. Understandably, sometimes they don't want to come and they've said, I've put this behind me. And then also sometimes we can't find the victims. Mm. Sometimes some of these cases do fall between the cracks and parole is considered without the victims necessarily being informed. But ideally, the victim also has the, the right. So if a victim of crime is out there, they can contact DCS. Um, and say, you know, they would like to sit down with the victim, uh, with the offender, and they would like to ask, ask some questions. And it's really done in a very professional and sensitive way. So the offender is prepared, and sometimes we might tell the victim, you know, it's, we don't think the offender is ready yet. Mm -hmm. And that is not to protect the offender, mm -hmm. but it's to protect the victim. I mean, it's no way I'm, I'm going to allow a victim to come and for that offender to re-victimize or re-traumatize the victim. Mm -hmm. So we really want the offender to be in a space where you can give that closure to the mm -hmm. victim. Um, sometimes we might also tell the victim, you can come, he might not give you the answers that you want to hear. Yeah. But I think it's also important for victims to know that those services are available should they want to, to make use of them. And they can contact the department. The best way would probably be through the investigative officer who investigated the, because yeah. I'm not sure about all of the, the red tape, but um, it is it is definitely a possibility for them to have the opportunity to sit down and ask the questions, possibly get some answers. Sometimes sometimes they aren't answers, but just just yeah, there is the opportunity for that. I can see VOD being very helpful when used correctly for victims and their families and especially when the offender is actually willing to participate openly and honestly. I think the idea of mediation with the offender's own family is also very valuable and probably helps a lot with their options when they leave prison as well. Understandably, I think that from a victim's perspective, they may very well not want to engage, but I do know of many families who still have unanswered questions decades after the crime that eat away at them. For defence purposes, I guess an offender will not always reveal everything in court, and even when it gets to the point of the sentencing hearing, they'll still have their appeals in mind. Once they've been in prison for a considerable period of time, and have hopefully had time to understand the consequences of their actions, by working with people like Zibeth, they may be more likely to share openly. I know that there's always the risk that offenders with some of the personality disorders Zibeth has spoken about may try to use that dialogue to their advantage. But as they have to be prepared by a team beforehand, I would think that such things would be picked up. Zibeth also offered to answer some of the listener questions that were originally put to psychiatrist Dr. Sean Bauman that he was unable to answer because they weren't in his field of expertise. One such question was whether in dealing with offenders it's possible to determine warning signs that may be present before violent crimes occur. This is what Zibeth had to say. 
yeah, so in terms of warning signs, there's not really one specific thing that we can say this is what causes violence. Mm. But I think when you speak to any any psychologist, they would most probably tell you the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. So if this person has been violent in the past and has a habit of being violent towards you, the chances of that person doing it again is quite high. Um, and obviously, violence escalates. Mm. So I think we see that a lot in terms of domestic partner violence, mm. where people continue to go back to these people because they love them and because they think they can change them. But unless there's really some work done on the part of the, the perpetrator, mm. the behavior isn't going to change. So if this guy has a tendency of hitting you or a tendency of, um, you know, taking weapons and aiming them at you, chances of that becoming more severe over time is very, very good. So that is the one, the one major thing. If there's a history of violence, mm. most probably there's going to be future violence. Like I said, there's no single contributing factor that we say this will definitely cause violence. But substances are one of the main contributing things, especially alcohol, but also our other substances, because it does impair judgment. It, just Im it does impair our impulse control. So someone who's intoxicated are much more likely to offend violently if they have a violent nature. So... Alcohol isn't going to make you violent if you, not violent in general, but if this person has a violent nature and they are intoxicated, the impulse control is just going to be so much less. So the chances of, of a violent incident happening is so much greater. The next question Zibeth chose to answer is whether the offenders she sees have some sort of pattern in their backgrounds and if they usually have difficult childhoods? Yeah, in terms of, of backgrounds, childhood trauma does play quite a significant role. So that can either be childhood sexual trauma, domestic violence, growing up in a violent household, growing up in a household where there wasn't really good relationships between the children and the parents, growing up in communities where they witness a lot of violence. So all of that actually relates to, to traumatic events. Mm. That does contribute to a lot of the offending. Mm. not going to say that every offender experiences that. There's a lot of factors that, that combine to, to lead to, to an offending behavior. But like I said earlier as well, if, if you get to know the person behind it, mm. everybody has a story. And I think... There's two ways of looking at it. Uh, we can say, you know, not everybody who goes through these childhood traumatic events become offenders. So it's not, it's not a definite factor. Mm. But a lot of the guys who do offend have traumatic childhood histories and just have been unable to, to deal with that and cope with that and develop the skills to, to manage those, those consequences. But just because someone has a bad background doesn't mean they're going to offend. Um, but a lot of our offenders do come from less favorable backgrounds. So we do see a lot of economic um, deprivation. And I think in the Western Cape and other areas of the country as well, but something that we see quite often, especially in terms of economic deprivation, is that a lot of the guys become involved with gang activities from a very, very young age. Yeah. And they kind of mature into the, the violent lifestyle of, of the gang activities. So does it play a role? Definitely. Is it a 100% predictor? Definitely not. And I think that's always the answer people seek in these cases of violent crime. Is it nature or is it nurture? And really, it's both and a whole bunch of other factors. There is no recipe for a violent offender. But considering childhood trauma does play a major role, I think that's a pretty good place to start. Zibeth says that a question she gets a lot is whether she's alone with these offenders and also whether she's ever been scared of someone she's treated. I've never been physically scared in conducting my job. I think there are security measures in place 
I am alone in a room when I when I speak to them and when we consult, but there's normally a guard somewhere outside. So they, it's not like I see them and I'm at the back of the prison somewhere with no help to get there. But in the room, it's just me. They aren't handcuffed. They sit and we sit across from the table having a conversation. I've never, yeah, I've never feared for my life, but I also think you can never be complacent. You have to always be aware of where you work and you have to be remain vigilant. You have to know your environment and the circumstances. You have to have some knowledge about the prison gangs because all of that play a role in your role with the guys and how they interact with you, as well as the dynamics within the, in the center at a specific given time. But I've never been scared. I've never felt like I was in danger, but you always put things in place. For example, um, you can't have a desk full of things that can be used as weapons. So obviously everything must be clear. I, for example, I don't leave a pen with them. So they sign what they need to sign. I take the pen back and then we start the, the conversation. So there's certain things that you are vigilant of and that you make sure you don't give them the opportunity to react. And you also learn to read situations. So you can see if someone becomes aggressive or agitated and then you can either calm them down or you can say that you'll re resume the conversation at, at the next date. Mm -hmm. So you always, you have to look out for yourself, um, but you have never been scared. I was interested in what the process for rehabilitating an offender and everything that goes into it looks like. This is what Zibeth had to say. Okay, so in terms of you know, the rehabilitation process, we have what we call an offender rehabilitation pathway, ORP. Um, and that involves a lot of different inputs from different people within the correctional environment. And that goes from their case officer. That would be the person responsible for this inmate. So a guard who's primarily responsible for a number of offenders. Mm -hmm. And he would periodically write reports on, on them about their behavior, how they are doing, if he picked up something that they might need specific help with. So for example, aggression or anger, or if there's gang involvement. So all of those things would be picked up by the case officer. Then we would have what we call CIOs, um, and they are correctional supervision officers. They kind of intervene on correctional programs. So we have quite a few correctional programs, which is just basic introductory programs on, oh, there's so many, anger management, substance mm. abuse, staying away from gang activities, uh, life skills. So there's, there's quite a few programs being presented just on a psychoeducational level. And then we have spiritual care services. So we have outside spiritual care workers coming in. Mm -hmm. um, we have various denominations and religions who present services and counseling in terms of religious, the religious part and the spiritual part of these offenders. We have an education system. Maybe that's something we haven't mm. really touched on. Yeah. But in terms of education, so up until matric level, they can study for free. So which is the same right to basic education that's offered to all South Africans. So you can go to a school and you can obtain a matric and basic education. There are places where you can obtain that for free. Mm -hmm. Should they prefer to do extra tertiary studies, mm -hmm. they have to find funding for themselves. So either their family pays or if they can find someone who's willing to get a bur give a bursary to them. But tertiary studies are not for free. So I think that's also a misconception that the public has is that these guys can just study through university for free. Mm -hmm. So they don't. Um, they actually have to pay for their tertiary studies if they wish to be involved in that. Um, there's also skills training where we try and teach these guys a skill that m would make them employable outside. So bricklaying, welding, uh, leatherworks, uh, woodwork, um, carpentry Ooh. is the proper word for that. So just to teach them a skill so that we can upskill them in a job market and be competitive in a job market so that they can provide for themselves. Yeah. Then we have social work services. The social workers actually contribute largely to, to rehabilitation. Um, so they interact with the families. They sort out a lot of the 
interpersonal and family problems that these guys experience, but they then also conduct research-based and um, reviewed intervention programs for these guys, therapeutic programs, based on the specific offence that these guys are there for. So they also have a substance abuse program and a sexual offender treatment program, an aggression program. So that would be based on on the offence that the offender is there for. Mm. And he would attend the therapeutic program. And then we have psychological services and we intervene on the criminogenic needs but also the mental health care needs. Mm -hmm. Um, And then a lot of these guys are also sometimes employed within the prison um, system. So they are cleaners. So just to keep them busy and out of out of trouble mm. um, because they do spend a lot of times otherwise yeah. in their cells. Yeah. So just to keep them busy and, and give them something to do. There's recreational activities that's being done. So yeah, just some games and sports that they are engaged in. For example, soccer and cricket, they would be allowed to do that from time to time. So it's all about just kind of teaching them a balanced, healthy, non-criminal lifestyle and also engaging them in non-criminal leisure activities. Mm. So yeah, the the rehabilitation really comes from various aspects and on various levels Mm. for these guys. Now that is a misconception that I was definitely guilty of. I honestly believed that offenders could study for free. And clearly that's not the case. It's really interesting how these myths have crept into the narrative that we have around offenders and prisons in general. I cannot thank Zibeth enough for taking the time to come out and talk to me. Everything that she shared was absolutely fascinating. And it's really only by getting this type of information from knowledgeable sources, that we can start to change the narrative about violent crime and offender rehabilitation in our country. As a citizen of South Africa, I am really glad that we have people like Zibeth Hansen in our correctional facilities. As much as we sometimes feel like offenders should just be locked away from society for the rest of their lives, this is just not viable. So the fact that we have someone like her that is so passionate about what she does really does give me hope. It was actually really nice to see when we chatted off air how proud Zibeth is of the progress some of her patients are making. And I think that she should be proud of herself too because she really is changing lives. Thank you for listening to my interview with Zibeth Hansen, clinical psychologist in the Department of Correctional Services. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe to the show on the platform you're using to listen right now. You can also follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. I'll be back next Friday with another episode. Until then, as always, thank you for your support and I'll chat to you soon. (music) 